Um, all right, so I think it's about get to the time, um, and let's get started. Okay, so I'll conduct this talk in English, um, since, since we have some foreign guests here. Um, my name is Chen, and today I'm going to talk to you about how we uh, use large language models to help us to, simpli to simplify our cluster management. Um, a little introduction about me. Um, I started my career at Google as an SRE, and in 2019, I moved to Ant Group to become a tech lead and a manager for an uh, infrastructure SRE team. Um, basically, I focused on, um, say, Kubernetes and other cloud native like solutions in Ant Group. Um, as an SRE, uh, we wear different hats during our day to day life, such as, say, we write automation programs to say to optimize our like uh, toils and operations, right? And sometimes we do like um, firefightings to handle production issues. And in the past few years, uh, we've seen a huge growth in our like cluster size as well as the pod size. But still, we remain a uh, very uh, fixed SRE headcount. So that means we need to seek any uh, every help we have to help us to facilitate our day-to-day -day life. And this year, I believe like um, language model is a hot topic, so we are trying to tackle this issue with language model. Okay, so before we get into the details, um, I want to quickly clarify that this talk is not about uh, like a GPT-101 course. I'm not gonna touch any pre-training uh, pre steps or any other like algorithms for uh, supervised fine tuning like PFTs. And I know land training is kind of popular these days, so, but this is not a land training tutorial. And this project has nothing to do with the uh, Kubernetes GPT project on GitHub. Oh. Um, you know, in SRE Wordland, um, we handle a lot about failures and incident stories. So please think about this as a postmortem review or a progress report on our exploration to language models instead of any like uh, best practice. There's no best practice at this point of time, I think. Okay. Um, I will conduct this talk in the following four sections. Um, qu I'll quickly go through our motivations about why we are gonna use language models. And I will then do a quick definition on our goals and requirements and comes to our fun part about how we conduct different experiments or attempts to solve the issue. And hopefully you guys can all take some, like um, get some idea and get some takeaways. All right, so remember the topic today is about cluster management. And um, here is our motivation. So imagine on a typical day, like um, when you just sit down on in front of a desk with a cup of coffee, and your pager just got alerted, and it says multiple clusters were on fire, and some nodes were kept getting OMs, and apparently this time, you have no choice but to jump into a war room to solve the issue, because multiple business leaders was already yelling at you, say their business was getting impacted, and your big boss it was watching behind you and asking you for the reason for the mitigation steps and etc. Et so you are desperate to find out, okay, so what are the correlations between these nodes, right? Are they all from a specific CPU model or if they are on a specific kernel version or a particular type of application was running on top of them? And you have a million of assumptions here and you would like to quickly verify them. But I highly doubt that um, under high such high pressure and under such like emergency scenarios, you can type those two control commands correctly in a single pass. And so that's why, that's the first motivation. And it took us about an hour to actually figure out in this particular case, it was from a daemon set change that actually um, has some performance issue on a certain typical um, CPU model. Okay. So in the postmodern review, um, one action item we agreed was to, how can we shorten the time uh, to pinpoint or to locate the problem, right? Um, at that point of time, actually multiple tech leaders 
join the war room and they contribute very um, thoughtful and very, very valuable information and their assumptions. But they are not from the Kubernetes team, so they cannot actually get into the touch with the cluster management, but their ideas were actually valid. Um, so we need a solution to help them to let them can do some quick self-service like uh, miti mitigation or their verification by themselves. And also like um, during the mitigation stage on this uh, incident, uh, we have to ask users to do some self-service operations like um, to scale up their deployment or to do some node reboot and some traffic drains. So these actions were actually not that frequently used um, in their day-to-day -day life, right? So they cannot remember all those commands correctly or like can quickly pull out all those knowledge they need. So we categorize this type of issue as the operational efficiency um, in the entire picture of the uh, cluster management world. As you can see, it may just be a tip of the iceberg and we are facing many different challenges. I think um, each topic listed out here actually worth a separate discussion, um, but let's do, let's be more concentrated today. So let's go to the definition part. So remember, um, I think for, for us, like we conclude that what we need is actually um, a solution to help us can quickly transfer like human intention or human language to like um, uh, actually machine API calls or whatever can interact with the machine directly, right? Um, in the operational world, everything is just like a command to a specific system or like sending an API call or just tuning some like kernel like parameters, right? All those data are actually structured data. But human intentions, we have a million or a thousand way to like, express them. So what can we feel in this question mark here? So before the language model like becomes a hot topic, I think like we write all those automation programs, we write all the like pass uh, web front end, all the solutions. Uh, you have like um, a, web, a website with a bunch of clicks and uh, buttons and you just type in your um, so some parameters so that you can get, for example, um, try to reboot your node or try to scale up your um, deployment. So in this scenario, I think um, we are actually writing a user interface and that user interface actually does the translation between the uh, unstructured data, like between our, our intention to, the, to what the machine or the cluster management actually need, the APIs, right? And since language models naturally takes the um, human language as an input, so we think, okay, maybe let's just try that. Let's use a language model for uh, to be the new user interface. But using that in the SRE land is kind of like dangerous. As you can see, like we categorize the issue into, um, to use that, we have to be very careful about the input and the output from the language generated by the language model, right? Um, I think they, we listed out the four different cri criteria uh, we need um, to verify if a model is valid and can be used in production. And first is about uh, accuracy. Um, the accuracy here is actually, uh, we have a very high standard. Um, I think it's about above 99% accuracy. Um, remember, like, you are actually operating with the cluster, right? If you want to reboot a single node A, but the language model generated the answer to reboot a node B, it will be totally unacceptable, right? And also like the latency, I think it's, we actually all want this, this thing to happen really fast, right? Otherwise you may miss the window to actually mitigate the issue. Um, I know like if we experience some like online, like ChatGPT or whatever, um, all those chat models, um, sometimes the latency can be a little high, uh, which is uh, not that uh, acceptable in our scenario. And also, like for the security concern, we are not gonna share our internal data to like any public models, right? You are not going to handle in your like internal security. Uh, they'd be 
it will be very vulnerable, right? So we have to like um, use our own model, and at least we need to host it by ourselves. And for all those internal APIs and for all those like uh, our internal operations, they are like evolving really fast. And language model has to like keep up with the pace of the API involvement. So that's the fourth criteria. Okay. So enough for the abstraction on this type of problem, and now comes the fun part. So next, I will share some um, experiments we did to play with the language model. Um, so the first, the first attempt is about to do like API invocation. Um, by the time we had this idea, uh, I, I think at that point, uh, Langchain and AutoGPT was attracting everyone's attention. And so everyone was talking about how can we make an agent to learn to use some tools to help us to solve a particular like domain issues in a domain, right? So let's make an agent that can solve the issue for Kubernetes. So we quickly drew the following diagram um, to express the, the workflow of, so when SRE speaks some language to express their intention, it can go through a, uh, plan the model, which is a language model that can help you do, um, to plan the actions. And the actions can be executed by different executors, and each executor uh, is corresponding to a, a deterministic API call or a function that can interact with the machines directly. Okay. So, so far so good. Okay. And by the time we had that idea, um, we already like, um, we had a jump start. We, at that point of time, we already deployed a chatbot. Uh, we, we call it the ops bot um, in, our, like, uh, in our production to help our on-caller to try to solve their uh, on-call issues. So what we had at the point of time was like if you say uh, there was an alert uh, fired and you got notified, you would like to do a simple restart, and you just type in the chatbot, uh, say, okay, so restart dash dash uh, component API server dash dash uh, cluster full, so that the, um, the bot will do the restart for you. But um, at that point of time, we had already deployed this bot uh, in production for at least a year. But it was not frequently used, and people were, people don't like it because uh, they cannot remember all those commands um, correctly and they cannot type those um, command like in a, in a single pass. So here comes the language model, right? You would like to naturally think, okay, so if I can say just say, help me do a simple restart and the model can understand and extract the uh, uh, named entity, let's say the component entity called API server and the cluster entity and then fill in the um, API call and just uh, makes the call. Okay, so I think the workflow is kind of very straightforward, but we quickly hit our like bottleneck, which is um, we cannot use the open models because open models does not have the internal knowledge from our perspective, right? They don't know how we, in end group, how we do like model rest uh, machine restart or how we, form our APIs, right? We have to teach them. But for security concerns, we cannot actually use the, uh, uh, the OpenAI open AI or the uh, ChatGPT. And luckily, at that point of time, we already started our like internal language model development. So we already had some like internal models to do like supervised fine tuning on top of them to see the result. So the question next is to generate all those training data you need, right? As you can see, the training data was uh, about like a bunch of question and answer pairs where I can write some templates in a prompt and say, okay, so restart a node, or I have diff different ways to, rep to express this single action, right? And you have that very fixed action format um, to, fill in the mo to fill in the model. And you then just replace the node with uh, different entities uh, in your domain. So here's our first experiment. 
we picked about 10 uh, APIs from our like ops bot, um, such as like um, scale up your deployment or uh, reboot a single node or like say help me retrieve the um, the pod in a specific namespace. And then we generate about like 40,000 uh, question answer pairs as the training data for our fine tuning. And we then use like five different model candidates and we throw the data in and hopefully to see, to see magic happen. <laughs> and it did happen and uh, we picked three models. Uh, at that point, I don't think Code Llama or like Llama 2 was available. So we used GPT Neo and some GPTJ as a uh, benchmark. And we have our internal models um, to, to do fine tuning as well. So as you can see, it did help us to like extract the uh, named entity, like the IPs, like the, uh, the pods, and like the nameplace as well. And also it can classify the intention like in a very good accuracy. So we quickly like made a prototype and replaced our chatbot with this language model. Yeah. However, uh, when we asked the user feedback, um, it was not that good. Actually, the model failed in multiple aspects. And one thing is that it failed to comprehend different constraints set by the users when curing for Kubernetes resources. I'll give you a few examples. And let's say, OK, so you know, users may ask, help me retrieve the pod in a pending status, plus um, the pod has been there for four hours. Or they want to get all uh, nodes in a specific kernel version, or they have all these kind of strange questions that you cannot enumerate all of them in your training data, right? So I don't know if any one of you can write a single kube control command to get all these information. Uh, at least I can't. <laughs> so, but let's see. So someone in my team said, okay, maybe we just try to train a model Right, to translate the human intention to, to the kube control commands, plus some like shell script like to do some grab, to do some AWK to get the result. But this idea uh, got quickly vetoed because for the several reasons. First, I think um, shell scripts are less structured and it is too like flexible and too powerful. It can actually generate malicious data and can be dangerous if you blindly trust the output. For example, what if it generated a command say kube control delete pod dash dash all namespace, right? Then it will be doomed. And it's hard to validate, right? How can you evaluate if this shell script, you have a million ways to write, a, to get the same, same result like in, in shell script, right? So at that point of time, um, we had another like idea from our current team. Um, uh, our DBA team, they had this called DBGPT, this idea. So the idea is about to translate human intention like in, in text to SQL language. So we think, okay, what if we can query Kubernetes resources like what we do uh, using a SQL format? Because SQL formats are, can be more controllable and auditable, right? And we have so many like SQL data that we can use to do like um, fine tuning or do model training. So we had our prototype and we say, okay, what if we can do this? Like instead of letting the language model to query the cluster uh, directly, let's add a cache layer. So the cache layer was like a controller and followed by the uh, list watch concept that you can actually cache all the pods, all the nodes, all the resources you want. And we do some tricks to convert them to like um, to a format that SQL engine can understand and can retrieve the data. And that's when we can get some like table schema from SQL, right, from the data database schemas. And together with the user's question and their intention, um, together with the table schema, we throw them to the language model and hopefully it can generate the SQL that can be used to retrieve the data. Okay, so because of the time limit, I won't get into how we do the SQL conversion here today, uh, but we can do it like offline or in another time. 
So we had this idea, and we had this uh, prototype. But still, uh, we are, um, the users were still not buying it because uh, there are still too many knowledges, internal knowledges, that are represented by, let's say, the labels and annotations on those parts. You know, like everyone, ex especially for all those custom controllers or the operators, they love to patch like labels and annotations on those parts and nodes to make them special and give them like different meanings. So it seems like we get stuck here. So what can we do? How can we like improve this? So let's go back to uh, some basics. So at that point of time, we say, okay, let's take a step back and let's see um, test the how test the cap capability of the language model. So we run two simple tests. One simple test is to say, given a YAML snippet, can a language model actually um, say extract the targeted value based on the label's name? I think this is a very um, decent and very simple task, right? It's just a key value lookup, and um, so we quickly like say generated um, some synthetic data, like this YAML snippet, and we generate a bunch of questions, either asking like one label value, two label values, or mix a bunch of them, and to see the result. And we use the, uh, our internal model to do like fine tuning to, to test it. Okay, so these um, table and diagrams here, actually different people can have different interpretation from that, um, and our insight, from our insight, um, one thing is that the model's accuracy actually is determined by the coverage of the training samples. Um, what does it mean? Um, so about if the model can learn like 60% of the label, like in the training data, for the rest of the 40%, if the, if the label itself was not shown in the training data set, it can still like recognize them and successfully extract the value uh, with a very high accuracy. So that means like the models are not just memorizing everything and it does have the ability to learn a pattern. So that gives us confidence. But in reality, I don't think anyone's going, going to ask this question to the model, right? You can just do it by yourself or just do a simple grab to get the answer. But uh, what if we ask if the language model can extract the target value based on the label's meaning instead instead of by the label's name, right? So here I give another example. Let's say uh, there is another like custom key called XYZ uh, as a label. And there's a background knowledge here. Let's say if that label means the pod is able to survive um, during a short-term system blip. Okay, so when the user asks, if the port is going to survive during a kubelet hot update, which is like a short-term system blip, right? The model should be able to answer with yes. Okay, then we, um, we do another experiment in this scenario, like, but um, due to the time limit, I won't get into much details, but in this time, um, I think Langchain frameworks was already popular and were so we try to use that and so to combine the background knowledge. So we use some background knowledge plus with the YAML data, plus with the user question and filling them to generate a bunch of like training data to train our internal model. And also um, we know like uh, everyone says there is a new job called prompting, prompt engineer, right? So we try different prompt techniques, for example, like the chain of thought. Um, they do actually help to get the results better. Um, for example, as you can see, um, uh, no matter which, on the model size, whether it's a 1.3 billion model size or 6 billion model size, uh, with the COT and the memory and the background knowledge, it can actually answer the question better, especially for those labels and keys uh, the model doesn't see in the training data. Okay, so putting things together, right? So here's our final solution to say, uh, how can you use language model to curate a single Kubernetes resources uh, with different user constraints and the setup. 
So what do we have here? Like we have a prompt engine that can do different prompting strategy like chain of thought or self-consistency or anything you can mention. And the engine can actually uh, interact with our internal knowledge database which can um, fetch um, corresponding like background knowledge with the user's input, right? Together with the pod uh, SQL table schema, uh, we can send them to the language model to get back the SQL itself. Um, and then on the um, caching and the, uh, the Kubernetes part, we also added a federation layer so that we can only, uh, not only can we like just query for one single cluster, but also we can query things across multiple clusters. So that's our final design here. All right. So a quick summary. Um, so what have we, have we achieved so far? So remember, like in our experiment, uh, no matter it's um, like API invocation or the kube control like get command, I think language model has the potential to be a good SRE pilot, and it can, it has already demonstrated its capability to do named entity recognition as well as like intention classification, and for these very specific tasks, I don't think you need a like a a hundred billion size model or a smaller model may already um, be enough for this type of case. But still, like, remember our task is to operate the um, cluster, right? But at this point of time, I don't think language model itself can operate the cluster by, by itself. Still, it needs careful education and humans need to, be to do, like, uh, re-evaluation. Um, so it can be a good co-pilot help you to generate the command quickly, or help you to like say, write a bunch of SQL or write a bunch of configuration code. But uh, let's not be that creative, right? Because in our scenario, we want operational efficiency, we want productivity, and that's a very deterministic problem. Okay, so there's no silver bullet like to all the questions I listed out here uh, during our journey. Uh, I think hallucination is the top enemy, um, especially in, in our scenario. Um, and long context is uh, actually one of the challenges we are going to tackle next. Because um, we did a bunch of, like, we estimated how many, like, tokens we use for a single query, actually, with, we sent to the language model. Um, currently, it's about, like, 4,000 tokens each time. So that's about the... Um, I think all the common models or the currently uh, available online, uh, they all just take about 40, like 4,000 tokens one time, right? So if we want to add more like background knowledge or we want to do more like prompting techniques, it requires a longer context and um, that's the issue we are gonna tackle next. And everyone's talk about like multimodality, like using text, pictures, and et cetera. But in the SRE world land, uh, I don't see any models today ca that can handle time series data, like logs, uh, metrics, or traces as well. Um, they all like have the similar issue with the long context problem. So I think everyone can think about this um, because I think there's still a long way to go. So finally, what are the lessons can we learn from today? Uh, I think, um, if you want to like use language model in your own scenario or in your own application, uh, you can use OpenAI as a very uh, good starting point um, to verify your idea. At least it can be, it is still a very good like baseline model you can use to test uh, in your own scenario. But once you determine that, okay, this might be the task or this might be the things I want to solve and you want to involve your own model, please focus on collecting your user data. And you know, like data is the key to this problem. As we all know, like uh, we all say that um, the quality of the data actually determines the quality or the upper bound of your model's performance. And algorithm itself is the way to help you to achieve that goal. But data is actually more important, all right. And 
in our journey, in our story, um, I skipped a lot about our engineering effort. But uh, actually, in, our, in the past six months, I think uh, we devote about 80% of time during, uh, for engineering work. Uh, because uh, training the model or uh, do some supervising is kind of like uh, straightforward as long as you can prepare the data. And please don't think of AI as a magic. And sometimes I think uh, in the SRE world, uh, sometimes some if else can already do the job. And if it's that case, you don't have to use the AI, right? So with that, uh, I will conclude my talk today. Um, we have our plan to like open source our model and and also the KubeQuery engine, but. Um, it's still in progress, and um, so you can follow this official account to like um, to keep up with our updates. Um, the official account is an account that I created last year. Um, I, my own intention was to like write some stories about SRE wo uh, work life or like do some SRE best practices, but uh, yeah, I'm going to do a. There's not much in the official account yet but we'll do it later. Yeah, so thank you all for coming today. I know it's about time and it's about holiday time, so happy holidays. Yeah, yeah I can take some questions like in either Mandarin or English.首先我觉得这个思路很好啊对吧我也是SRE然后我们习惯于用Kubernetes然后我们习惯于用自己的经验然后你们你用这个方式去以后是一个发展方向那我首先我想问一下你在这个训练的过程中花了多少时间啊是
what your company does, yeah. right? So that part you have to like either use like uh, in context learning that provides this information to the to the model, or you do the fine tuning based on those like uh, uh, the like code llama or the other models already available. Yeah, you don't have to do it from scratch. Yeah. yeah. 其实我最后还有一个问题其实如果仅仅是一些 工程师更好的troubleshooting嘛，因为我们工程师的troubleshooting有些时候是一个推理的过程，但是它其实毕竟它其实不是一个，我理解不是一个推理的过程，对不对？所以说你觉得这方面它会有更多的contribution吗？That that okay. So the final question is about like um for troubleshooting, how can ChatGPT or the language model help us? Um, yes, I I haven't seen a lot of work in this area, but. My gut feeling is it can help, but we have to teach the model first. Uh -huh. Yeah, by teaching them, I mean, we have to like prepare lots of data. Yeah. Like think about it, like uh, if you are a seven year old like child, like you have to learn something, something new, right? Yeah. Your teacher will ask you to recite or to memorize something, like repeat it again and again, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's what we do to language model, yeah. right? During the training phase, yeah. right? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we we should, we are definitely trying that, uh -huh. but uh, I think it still requires time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>
if the human itself needs to verify like if the SQL if this is the data is not what he wants, right? He can modify the SQL and do the query again. I think the tool itself, the main purpose is not to get this thing 100% correctly, but to help you to quickly like get the SQL there, and so that you can do a small uh, tweaks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us your journey applying uh, LAM in this scenario. And that's a very interesting case. Um, what my question would be, when you open source the, this model, were you are, gonna, are you going to really release the entire model? So because we probably have the same issue as we are private domain and we do not want to use chat GPT. The major problem is they will have the data. So will you be sharing the model and so we can try ourselves? And this is certainly the very early days, yeah. and I really applaud what you did. For I think uh, there's a lots of application, including networking. Inclu there will be a lots of operation can be resolved by, by this, and as well as the LLM. I think there is uh, a place to reduce the human resources, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is about like what's our open source plan? <laughs> um, yeah, so. We are thinking about it. Like first, like um, we are like running experiment on like open source models like Llama two or like Code Llama, and I think like open source model itself is one way, and the other way, like what the keynote uh, talk today uh, in this morning, um, like the Hugging Face team, uh, they are like collecting all the data, right? Or if we can contribute the data, then maybe like different people can use them different ways. Yes, that's another option, but. Yeah, everything is still on plan, and you are welcome to uh, join us to talk later. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah. So um, let's say if I'm uh, have a reader role on um, a Kubernetes cluster, we if I use the natural language prompt, um, we inherit the same role based access permissions. Um, so your question is about the permission to operate in a system. Right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah, so currently, as you can see, like, um, as I mentioned, like, touching the system itself is kind of uh, dangerous. So uh, we have several guards. First, um, as you can see, we only tackle the curing part. So this is a read-only mod read model. And secondly, um, you don't want to, like, list out all your resources, right? It will, like, consume lots of memories and bandwidth to the API server. So we add the cache layer, right? So that's the two safeguards we have. Thank you. All right, so that's it. Thank you all.